evening uh, evening everyone um this is professor tennyson mokuchini welcome to part two of the um chapter development sessions the first part we we looked at developing chapters for those who are doing master's work and today we're going to focus on developing your cha chapters in preparation for a doctoral thesis. Uh, of course, we, we will probably in our midst have people who are doing their masters who are just interested and so forth. So I will, uh, I hope that this will reinforce the things that I shared with you yesterday. Um, and just another point of note, we have a session. Uh, our next session after this one, will be on Wednesday the 6th of October. Excuse me, and that session is actually a troubleshooting uh, session. It's a, um, a session that I've created to allow you all an opportunity to really just have questions, ask me questions about your work and so forth. So the way that it will run is, of course, at six o'clock, I will, I will, uh, we will turn on the, the live event and then we will allow maybe the first 10 15 minutes for people to work on uh, posing their questions and once they've done that i will then use the rest of the evening to to respond uh, to the questions that have been raised that's what next week will be this week uh, as i speak now we are going to look at chapter development so i will walk you through the structure of a typical standardized doctoral thesis and i i mention typical i mention standardized because what i will show you is what the textbook say is the normalized standardized approach to writing a doctoral thesis but some of you in fact all of you will come from departmental spaces from colleges from disciplines where they've revised things a little bit to accommodate accommodate their specific preferences. Of course, I can't ex anticipate every single revision that has been made, and the most helpful type of guidance to give you is that you should listen to this presentation I do, then go to your respective uh, department where you're doing your, your doctorate or your respective school or your respective college, and find out specifically what their instructions are. And then you should be able to marry uh, both my guidance and their guidance. Ideally, the two should be very, very similar, but I can assure you that um, the variations that different colleges and different disciplines make, there will be some differences. Now, uh, with tonight as per normal, I will present I will do the presentation that I have and once I've done the presentation I will um, open up the floor or I will look at the questions that have been presented and respond to them. I of course am going to turn off my video in literally 10 seconds from now to allow us to focus exclusively on the presentation as opposed to to watching my face and so forth and whatever else. So um, now, another administrative uh, provision that you should be aware of is that with each of these sessions that we have, we we set them up and avail them to you uh, through us emailing the link to everybody. Uh, you also know that if uh, uh, we have a, a YouTube, we have a YouTube uh, channel that carries all our all our videos that we have for each of the sessions. This particular video will not be on there for another three or four days because it needs we need to review it. We need to edit it. We need to to basically make sure that it's of a quality that we are happy with. Right, so as I say, once again, the focus of today's session. Is to speak you through the chapter development processes within a doctoral thesis. 
Now, of course, as all of you realize, with all of these outputs that you submit to universities, they they come in certain parts. They they come with different sections. And when people generally talk about chapter development, they are talking about uh, chapters one to seven or whatever the number of chapters is. But what I want to just highlight is that when I speak to you about your doctoral thesis, I must mention some of the preliminaries, the, the things that happen uh, are uh, inputted into the document at the very, very beginning. The body and the text will relate to the, the actual physical chapters that I will speak you through and guide you through. Then, of course, uh, we have the section that has references. And after that, uh, the session with references, we refer to appendices. Uh, the appendices being all the range of things that would have been referred to within your thesis, but not necessarily included in it, but attached to the thesis as examples of people, ex as exhibits of what people can, uh, what the reader can refer to. So in, in that appendices section, there will be a number of things, you know, people will include the consent, a copy of the consent letter that they developed, a copy of the ethics certificates to show that they've got ethical clearance and so forth and so forth. So when I speak to you about your doctoral thesis, I will identify and speak to all these sections, the preliminaries, the body and the text of the thesis, the references and the appendices. And just another point of note, and I hope that um, you are ready for this. I have a generic uh, presentation that I, I give to you, I present to you, but you will need to look at the generic presentation that I give and make specific revisions so that it meets the requirements of your work. And also, you may be listening to things that I'm saying which you think are of particular reference to you and I ask that you keep a pen or a paper and you make sure that when you hear the things I say you are able to just take note of them as reminders. The presentations or the slides that you have in front of you don't necessarily give all the detail and I'm um, on this occasion specifically asking you to have a pen and a paper so you can kind of get a closer um, insight into things and record things specifically for you. You of course have this the audio of this presentation for you to review everything that I've said. Now when we talk about um, A dissertation when we talk about the thesis. Now, the first thing I must tell you is generally speaking, people will call a doctoral um, a doctoral monograph. They call that a thesis. And generally speaking, they will call a master's level um, piece of work a dissertation. But ironically, as the Americans you always do, they turn things backwards. So you'll find that if you're speaking to Americans, they call uh, a master's level of work a thesis, but they call a doctorate level a dissertation. But in the South African context, the thesis relates to a doctoral piece of work. The dissertation relates to a master's piece of work. And the reason that we call a doctorate a thesis is because there's an expectation that you will theorize. You know, people come up with a, a theory form formulation, which is in essence a, a thesis. So the preliminaries, when you think about that big document that you call your doctoral thesis, the preliminaries will be that first front page with the, the title of the thesis. That, folks, the detailed structuring of that and the content of it 
you extract from the tutorial letter that relates to the program of study that you in. So each of you have a course, whatever course you have signed up for. When you are on that course, the the course comes with a tutorial letter that tells you that oh this module is like this. It will tell you how you submit things, and one of the things it tells you is its layout of your final summative thesis document. It also speaks about things like the font sizes you can use and so forth. So the that front page, the specification of what it should have is given to you within your your guide for the module where this research work is resides. Once you have done um, the front page, the next page, which is not referred to here, but should exist and it's a new introduction, is a page where you write a brief um, academic integrity statement. Now, all of you, when you go to your specific uh, course tutorials, the tutorials that you, you, you use, the tutorial documents that speak to your thesis, your thesis, you will find that in there they have an example of a, a declaration. They call it a declaration and it is a statement where you just basically write something like uh, you confirming that the work is indeed original, that you have adhered and stuck to all the rules around plagiarism and that in instances where you have uh, quoted directly from sources you have done so by ensuring that um, uh, you appropriately reference those things and you give them their due acknowledgement so that's a, a statement that takes its own page as a preliminary, so after the, the, the this is title page, you will have this declaration page. Then the next thing that you have is the acknowledgement section. Folks, this is written in first person mode, so you'll be saying I thank so and so. Um, and it is important you have it because if you don't have it, it gives the examiner a sense that you believe that you wrote and developed this work on your own. And um, and the general advice is that don't forget to include your supervisor, but if you exclude them for a very specific reason, that's up to you. It's not a requirement, it's not a mandate. But that's the second, that's the, after the dissertation title, you have the, 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 the statement, the declaration statement that's made, you have an acknowledgements page, and folks, acknowledgements should not exceed a page. I know you think that, hey, my doctorate will be published. I want everyone who's ever met me to be thanked. It's not quite how it works. You have to revise that. Then the next thing that happens is after the acknowledgments, you have an abstract. I will speak to you about what the abstract, how the abstract is developed, how it looks. In fact, it's literally a short summary of your uh, thesis. And in it, normally with an abstract, people will have the first section will be a background part. And that background just basically gives details of the problem that um, has triggered you to want to study something. The next section after that is you stating what the aim of your study was. Uh, and then the next part of an abstract is the methods. So you would give it an overview, a very quick overview of the what design your study took, who who was responsible for, uh, or no, who was included as your data collection sources, what methodologies were utilized, and then after the met method section, you have a, a, a subheading that relates to findings. So people write a few sentences about the key findings that their study made. Then, of course, because it's a doctorate, your abstract should have a little bit of something about the unique contribution that your study is making. So you might say, um, as part of that 
acknowledgement of the unique contribution. You make a statement to acknowledge that this piece of work um, produced a framework that is meant to guide so and so and so and so and so. And that is, uh, and then of course, at the very, very end, you have a section where you talk about implications for practice. So you then say, look, these are the, in seeing that I found what I found, this is how what my discoveries are going to change the way that things are happening in practice. This is how they, they're going to change our way of thinking about research in the future. So that abstract is a short summary of the project of your of your thesis. It has a section that's background. Uh, it's subtitle background followed by aim, followed by methods, followed by findings, followed by a note to do with the original unique contribution of your study. Then you follow that at the very end with implications for practice and for future research. That it, those are the sections that you have in an abstract. Remember now I'm just saying this, this abstract is presented as one of the preliminaries. The other preliminary that you have is a table of contents. Uh, folks, I hope by now you have figured out that if you appropriately format your word document and you use appropriate styles of writing and so forth and so forth at the very end your table of contents will be just uh, a result of you pressing one button and then it generates itself generates all the the content that should have been there if you don't know how to do this automated self-populating option just go and Google it. Just go and Google it. Say Microsoft Word um, uh, instructions on how to develop a table of contents. Then it will speak you through the Google thing will speak you through very clearly on, on how you go about using Microsoft Word in a way that would allow you to have a document that has a self generating table of contents. After this preliminary, after your table of contents, you also then have a list of figures. This is just a list of all the graphs, images, illustrations, and they are ordered in the same number as they appear in your text, in your primary thesis. Then you follow that with a list of tables. And in some cases, the last two things, the list of abbreviations or the glossary and definition, definitions of terms, all of these are optional things that are dependent on whether your university has specified that they should be there or whether like maybe the list of abbreviations someone may discover um, uh, list of sorry the, the 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 list of abbreviations and the list of and the glossary definition of terms you may discover in your space that they are not required of you within your thesis document uh, because, for example, with abbreviations, they might argue that when you are actually writing the text, you do the abbreviations within that. So if, say, you are going to put South Africa, you would write the word South Africa and next to it put SA. And then from then on, anything that you write, instead of saying South Africa, you just say SA. So you've already uh, kind of orientated people to the abbreviations through the way you are writing rather than through having a list. Similarly, the glossary or definition of terms. There are some school of thoughts that say no, these terms will be defined within the actual thesis. They do not need to be defined at the very beginning. But all these things are a list of the things that you would consider to be preliminaries. They are the sort of things that you, you preliminarily have within your, your thesis document. They are literally the things that you throw in just after you've done and written up all your chapters. So that's them done. Now let's get to the actual chapters. Before we get to the actual chapters, I want to do a very quick 
acknowledgement or clarification of the different formats in which theses and dissertations may exist. By virtue of the fact that all of you are doing doctorates, your, your thesis will adopt a much, much more longer and difficult kind of structure compared to someone who's doing a minimalist, minimalist uh, uh, masters. So in the world of masters, they're in the world of people doing masters. They, they are, there's more than one type of a masters. People will talk about a masters that involves a dissertation of limited scope. They will talk about a masters that involves a mini dissertation. They will talk about a masters that involved a course based masters dissertation. All of these things are telling you one thing. They are saying to you that the version of the master's dissertation we want from you will somehow be smaller, compressed in ways that make it not the typical format for a traditional master's. And this is usually the case when people embark on a master's course and that master's course has um, maybe five little modules that people do modules that have nothing to do with research. Then the last module that they do is a research module. If you work, if you are on a master's program that is designed that way, where the research module is one of the many modules that you do, then in all likelihood, you are not doing a full master's. You are doing either a master's of limited scope, a mini master's and so forth and so forth. If you do that, then you, the, the output document, which becomes your dissertation, will always be much shorter than someone who has done study for two years and all they did in those two years was their study. So many of you will find that you're on a master's program. And on your master's program, the very first thing you did on your first day was to share the title of your study and all through the journey of your master's, all you do is just things related to this study. No other module, no other conversation except the module. If you do a master's that's like that, we call that a full research master's. And the shape and format of a full research master's dissertation is very similar to the shape of a doctoral thesis. It's based on a seven chapter model it can be seven or more chapters but really the rudimentary and entry level requirement is that you have seven chapters so i will speak you through each of those seven chapters so that but i'm speaking you through them at a doctoral level so you can get an appreciation of what these seven chapters look like for a student who is doing a doctorate um, the first chapter is the background and overview to the study. Chapter two is the literature review. Chapter three is the theoretical and conceptual framing of your study. Chapter four is the methodology section. Chapter five is where you present your results, your findings and the things you've discovered. Chapter, uh, chapter six is where you take all your findings and you might now generate a theory to explain to the reader what um, you found from the study and how you are generating new knowledge from it. Then finally, chapter seven is where you discuss uh, your your you discuss what your study has contributed and you draw you engage in some conversation about providing information around the conclusions that you have drawn. So this is a chapter seven chapter format and mine and my responsibility this evening is to walk you through those seven chapters. But remember, folks, and I will state this now, I've stated it before, but I will say it again. I give you a normalized, standardized version of what these chapters look like. But all of you must go and find a thesis that has been done in your field, in the department you're in, in the college you're from, 
look at how they've structured those chapters and see whether there are things that I have missed out on or, or given a different emphasis to which you will have um, reveal themselves when you look at other work. So essentially what I'm saying is that if there's anything that my session today tells you is the fact that I can teach you the middle of the road way of writing up chapters, but the detail that is necessary for you to get your chapter to align specifically with your chosen department, that detail comes from you looking at previous work. Nothing less, nothing more. OK, so now remember we spoke about uh, what we called um, the preliminaries, all the pre abstracts, all sorts and all these things. The very first thing that we deal with after this is the is actually what we call chapter one. In simple terms, folks, chapter one is where you introduce the topic. Uh, you provide us a background to some of the debates that exist in relation to the topic. And then you also give us an overview of the processes that you engaged in during the course of your study. Remember, chapter one is, uh, in theory, you write all your chapters after having done the study. So all of them are written in the past tense because they relate to you writing about things you've already done. Issue one. The second issue is that chapter one in particular is very similar to the contents of the proposal. So you will find that many of the things that are required from chapter one, you have done them in the proposal. The only difference is in the proposal you are going, you are saying I am going to, but in the chapter, in the actual chapter one, you are saying I have done. So one is in the future tense and another is in the past tense. And that's how uh, the differentiator, that's the most significant difference between your chapter one and indeed the, the proposal that gave you leeway to do the chapter one. So, um, right, now I want you to focus on the idea that in a chapter there are three things, in chapter one there are three purposes that this chapter has. Whether uh, how you go about presenting those three chapters, those three purposes is, is actually a product or an, uh, it's a product, a result of your own decision making. But no matter what you do, that one chapter must do three things. Firstly, and I've said it, sometimes people call it the introduction, comma, background and overview. The three things that it should do is one, the introduction, two is to give a background, three is to offer an overview. Now I need to tell you what those things are like so that you know that in the aspect that relates to introduction, what you do in the in the part that says introduction. You introduce us to the research problem that you're looking at, uh, how it uh, plays out in real life, the statistics behind this, uh, sensitizes really to, to this issue you have chosen to research. What is it that is significant? You can problematize the topic or not can, you must problematize the top topic. So whatever topic you've chosen, you need to tell us what what research research problems exist within it. Give us an overview of how this issue that you're looking at represents a viable problem. And to do that and to problematize something that you've chosen in academia, you can do so by showing stats that show how commonly problematic this issue that you're looking at is. Stats that will also show that people have tried to fix this and they continue to fail. Statistics that also speak to um, um, maybe the, the picture of something that's worsening. Uh, you, in addition to that, you make reference to issues that confirm 
the topical nature of your topic. When I say confirm topicality, I'm referring to you being able to demonstrate that whatever thing that you have chosen represents a current and uh, presently debated issue. And that is what topicality refers to. That property that makes something be able to claim that it is a, a, a current, it, it is a current challenge. It is an issue that if you were to read the discipline newspapers, it would be the headlines because it's topical, it's being, the contemporary knowledge is questioning and is interested in this. The other way that you show or magnify your problem is to refer to its relevance. Relevance is similar to topicality, but it differs in a strange sort of way. Relevance relates to uh, the fact, um, relevance relates to the, to the presentation of priorities within a study field, but the presentation of them throughout the chronology of that problem. So in basic facts, what I'm basically what I'm saying relevance is, is you being able to show that this problem you are looking for has got a sustained long standing history. And if you can show that this problem that you're looking at is one that has been uh, relevant and important for X amount of years through the progression of whatever interest area you have, then you've shown that, hey, this thing that this uh, student X is looking at is actually not just a, a pan in the a, a fry in the pan type of thing where they 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 it's here today gone tomorrow it's a problem that has been persevering forever so in that way people demonstrate relevance by maybe citing from old references to show that the problem they're looking at has got a history they cite from references that may be 10, 15 years old until they cite from the references that are as early as yesterday. All of these things are a way of demonstrating that this topic that you're interesting, introducing or the problem that you're focusing on is a long standing one. So that's the relevance thing. Then of course, another way that you may problematize your topic apart from showing us the numbers behind it, the topical nature of it, the relevance of it, you may also be able to demonstrate that something is worth looking at, not because of numbers, by, but by virtue of its nature. And when I say nature, I am referring to the fact that there are some things that are substantial problems for society, but the reason they're substantial is not because of the numbers behind them, it's because they are actually quite horrific things on their own that they don't need numbers to make them a priority. They are a priority. Take, for example, you know, there, there is a, uh, the very rare but occasional reporting of maybe a, a parent who has abducted their child and run away. Uh, that can happen, but not so. Mm, it can happen, but statistically it's not a high high occurring thing if someone said hey uh country s has 25 million children but in 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 um in and amongst those 25 million children only 30 of them have been victims of being abducted by their parents by one of their parents for example the number is very low so statistically that problem is not serious but the nature of it is such that it's such a disturbing human experience that people would say look we want to study it regardless of whether it affects two people ten people hundred people and so forth so what i'm saying is that in your introduction when you are giving us an introduction to this topic you you tell us give us history of the topic, you give us the stats, you basically do things to magnify the importance and the 
and the nature of this thing you're looking at. You're basically trying to leave the reader thinking, whoa, this is indeed a serious problem. That's one part of what um, an introduction does. But of course, once you've identified that problem, one of the things that you do is to speak about the debates that exist in relation to the problem. So you, you acknowledge that, hey, there's ongoing issues that are contested in relation to this problem. And some of these ongoing issues are asking these particular questions because we currently don't have findings for them. Once you say that, you kind of open up. Once you acknowledge the fact that uh, there are unresolved issues relating to the topic you've chosen, then you open up the opportunity as the writer for you to say, guided by these knowledge gaps, the researcher was compelled to carry out a study whose primary aim was, and then you tell us what the aim of that study is, you tell us what the objectives of the study were, and so forth. All of that at the back end of you having introduced the problem. You've introduced the problem, you then said, oh, this problem compelled and drove me to design a study, and the study had this aim, the study has these objectives, and then once you, you specified those, those two things, you are now able to actually jump into the boat of the methodology, because you've told us what the aim of the study is, you've told us what the, the objectives of the studies were, then now you can provide an overview. That is an overview of the methods that were pursued and engaged in when you were actually undertaking the study. So the second or the third part of your of chapter one is literally you very quickly just giving a summarized overview of the different stages of your methodological aspects of the study. So you are giving a, a summary overview of the study and you will have a section that will talk to people about what research design the study adopted, what, what methodologies you used, who, who the primary participants of the studies were, what the key findings from your studies were, and all of those things, you, you mentioned them in the introduction as a way of giving a taster. It's a roadmap. It's the reader. It's you telling the reader that if you, if you read chapter one, it will tell you what to expect. And the things you will see in future chapters have been represented in chapter one, but only in snippets. It's a preview. It's a preview. It's uh, the same way that we have um, previews of movies, for example. Preview of a movie will just show you three or four scenes or acts, and those scenes tell you all the big parts about the study that you need to know. So that is essentially where um, what your introduction does. When it comes to you giving the overview of the, the methodologies, basically you go back to your uh, to your proposal and you say, right, in my proposal, I had a section that spoke about methodology and the section mentioned what the design of the study was and so forth and so forth. I'll do the same, but maybe revise, update and so forth. Then once you've got that sign that talks about methodology, then there'll be the next one that talks about uh, the data collection approaches. What what data was collected, from whom the sampling, the sampling bit, from whom did you collect the data? And um, it will then, you will also be able to indicate those little bits, just a little subheading that says sampling procedures, and you tell us about the sampling bit, little bit that talks about, um, um, uh, you'll have a, a, a little bit that talks maybe about uh, the context where the study was conducted. So you engage, you offer that, uh, you offer a little snippet, half a, uh, half a page that tells us that, hey, study was carried out in this locality. These are the key things about the area and so forth. Then at the very, the latter part of your, of your overview has two, has a distinct, 
distinct item that only exists in a doctorate. You will make sure that in the introduction of your doctorate, somewhere towards the end of chapter one, you give and specify what the unique contribution of your study is. We need that so you can clearly separate out your a master's level chapter one from a doctoral level chapter one. So and and that normally people spend three quarters of a page just saying these are the unique things or the unique contribution that my study makes. It provides for the first time. It provides a um, a what is it provides a a framework for understanding problem X. Uh, my study used data collection approaches that no one else has used, and so forth and so forth. Those become the things that you specify in that critically important subheading that says the origin, the unique contributions made by my study. Don't omit that doctoral level because if you don't have it, then you are suggesting that your study made no original contributions. And if it made no original contribution, then the issue is starts to the issue that one raises is the question about whether your study is indeed a doctorate as it claims to be, or is it something that could be mistaken for a master's level piece of work? Then after along the same place, please don't remember, don't forget that in your methodology section, you would have included a section where you tell the reader about the ethical provisions and considerations that were taken in ensuring that you had the study. So someone, people will note and make mention of the fact that ethical clearance was sought and received from this particular ethics committee and that the primary ethical considerations that were looked at were privacy, dignity, and whatever the ethical considerations were. But those need to be stated towards the latter part of, of your introductory chapter. Once you have done that, then you are in a position now to really close, uh, to close this chapter one by literally saying, look, now that I've given you a proper overview of what my study is about, I want to end the chapter by just telling you, that, giving you information about the fact that chapter one is introduction and background, chapter two is literature review, chapter three is this, chapter four is that. You have that section there just to give a, an overview of a quick roadmap of what the rest of the thesis that you're engaging in will look like. Now, folks, that is chapter one. Now, we go on to chapter two. Now, folks, once again, no, first quick rewind. Chapter one, I have given you all the key elements, the thinking processes, the rationale behind the chapter. Some of you might want much more, uh, much more uh, prescribed guidance. And what I want to suggest to you, if that, that's what you want, you go online and you just search uh, PDF of PhD. You'll find countless students, countless who have posted their PDFs for open reading. Then you go to their chapter ones and you say, ah, oh, these are the subheadings they had. Um, does this subheadings match, match the one that I, uh, do these subheadings match the ones that I've come up with? What can I do to make them better? Or how do I expand? So you use other pieces of work to guide you in terms of the, the subheadings, but in all likelihood, I expect you to have more. I expect you to have more subheadings than the piece of work that you are referring to as your example. Because if you're using it as an example, the very least that your own piece of work will have is the same amount of things as the example. But you can say, hey, this example is missing this subheading. I want this part included and so forth and so forth. Now, we now move on to chapter two. 
similar with chapter two and with every other chapter, and I won't stress it now, but I will uh, I will take it that you you will operate in this way for all the other chapters. Chapter two is the literature review. If you want to see what a typical what the subheadings of a literature review might look like, I suggest as I'm suggesting with every one of the other chapters, find a read a good a good example of a thesis from your field and look at what they did for the subheadings. You will probably find that their subheadings are missing things that you want to include. So you will end up with a, a, a rundown of subheadings that's much more thorough than the one that you have referred to. And in essence, if it's like that, then it's a way of reassuring yourself that, hey, if this example that I'm looking at was assessed and passed given a PhD, then obviously if I'm doing more than the example, I will at the very least also earn myself a PhD. But now when it comes to chapter two, chapter two has a very specific purpose and that specific purpose is to allow you to strategically discuss all the critical knowledge theories that exist in relation to your topic. So it allows you to discuss existing research by looking at all the old research that's presented your problem, how it's debated, the nature of the problem. All that research has to do is what we would call seminal research. It's long old, but it is it has offered us critical insight into your topic, insights that are almost shape the whole way that we see that topic. So you include them. You also are expected to provide a state of the science. And a state of the science it literally involves you looking at all the debates that exist in relation to a topic, all the people who say go left, all the ones that say go right, all the ones that say this, that go, and you come up with a conclusion of around what are the things that people acknowledge as critical problems in relation to this issue I'm looking at? What are the issues that everyone agrees on? What are the issues that people still have contest or disagreement about? What are the issues that everyone acknowledges we still need to know about? All those things are what a literature review should show us. Now, of course, when you are doing a literature review, there are certain things that you need to do. The first part of a literature review in any format or approach to the literature review is that you give the reader in your introduction to the literature review, you give them an overview of what chapter two is about, what the key components of chapter two will be, what the aim and proper purpose of that chapter will be. And then, of course, you some people will even define what a literature review is. And then from that also then say, look, before I actually talk to you about the actual review of the literature, I must give you insight into what we call my data search strategy. So in your literature review, you have a section in chapter two, you have a section that you call the data search strategy. In simple terms, it briefly articulates the way, uh, gives information to the reader about how you went about uh, deciding which terms were key and not relevant to or, or relevant to your, to your topic focus. It details uh, the process that you went through to find sources that you eventually re re reviewed. So it will tell you things like uh, it will specify what the terms, the search terms that you used were, what the results you were getting when you applied the search terms, which search engines you utilized, how you went about thinning down the results from 4,000 papers that seemed like they were talking to your topic to the 60 that you ended up with. All of that gets presented as part of 
uh, it gets presented as part of the data search strategy. Of course, along with it are things like where you would detail what inclusion or exclusion criteria you use to decide which theories or papers or research you're going to include and what research you, you are not going to include. And some of these uh, examples uh, or some of these um, um, parts of some of these parts of the of of the literature review, in particular, some of the parts that relate to the data search strategy, they they are much more explanatory than they are debative. So you will find that the data search strategy is literally you walking a person through things you did for you to find the literature that you ended up reviewing. And the gold test, they would normally say that the gold test is to make sure that you write a data search strategy that has so much detail that someone who wants to copy your work or who wants to copy your review process can go in there and uh, can go in there and follow all the steps that you told them you would follow and end up finding very similar uh, theoretical outputs as you because they followed the process you described. Right, so now um, we now know what the, the literature review is broadly about, but remember I have told you that the first section is you introducing what chapter two is about, defining the literature review, telling us what components it has. The second part of that is you giving us insights into the data search strategy. That is your overview of all the activities that you undertook to make sure that you had the right things to review. Then the next part after the data search strategy is the section where you do the actual reviewing of your work. And now when we talk about the actual reviewing of your work, remember we are now going to the space where you, you look at all the papers that you think were relevant and you decide that, hey, when I look at all these papers, it seems like the, the five themes are emerge, emerging. So I will accept. Uh, I will accept that there are five themes that are emerging and in my review, I will speak to each theme at a time. Uh, and when I say speak to each theme at a time, I will take all the research that I can find that talks about this particular angle and debate it out. Decide what are the seminal contributions that are being made, what is the state of the science, who's arguing what, where do people agree, where do they disagree, where is there opportunities for us to know more. And you do that with the first theme, then you do the same with the second theme, you do the same with the fourth theme, until maybe at the very end of the paper you're saying, look, I have shown through looking at the different areas of this problem that I'm interested in, I've shown that there's agreement on this, there's disagreement on this, and there's outstanding knowledge as it relates to this. So, and the importance with uh, having the latter part of your literature review state what the knowledge gaps that you have been able to find are, is that this allows you to then almost align your particular interest or study with what the literature review showed you. Because if the literature review shows you that, hey, there's uh, these four areas that still represent critical uh, blind spots for us, then you can literally tag onto that and say, guided by the findings of the literature review, the study that you chose had a focus X or whatever. So you, you are now linking that literature review to the to the eventual research question that you did. That becomes chapter two. Okay? That is your chapter two. I've got something uh, puts up something up there about a summary overview of what an introduction does. But of course, this is already known to you because we discussed it. We've gone as far as even talking about the literature review. So in addition, in addition to 
how you write the literature review. There are some basic things that you need to, to make decisions about. So, we know that your literature review is you surveying existing research on your topic. You have to do it in a way that speaks to a coherent structure. You do it so you present varying arguments. Uh, you also want to do it so these value arguments can justify the eventual study question that you pursued. When you're doing this, uh, you you know you'll be synthesizing key findings from different places and so forth and so forth. You'll be highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of previous research. You'll highlight the limitations and gaps that exist in relation to the way research is done. You're also in a position where you are able to use the literature to to point everyone who's reading your literature review to the fact that you're chosen the emerging question that you're interested in is a worthy priority to be focused on so literally the literature review helps you to position your paper in relation to all the other things that are going on with all this being said there are different types and I've taught you up to this point that there are different typologies when it comes to literature reviews. So there are some people who will review their literature using just chronology as their template that they will say I review the 1940 papers, review the 1950 papers, review the 1960 papers or there are people who may decide that no, the type of literature review I want will be based on themes, emerging themes. So you can say this is one theme that emerged, so I'm going to review everything that relates to that theme. I will go to the next theme and so forth and so forth. That's the, that's the theme driven typology. Then there's also another typology where people might say, hey, my literature review is intended to ask, to answer or to give us clarity about how well we understand these three critical questions. Then if you know that the critical questions are this, you can look at, uh, you can look at the, if you know what the, the, the critical questions are, then you are in a position to, to look for literature that helps you to answer the different critical questions that you think exist in the discipline or in the field that you're in. If you base your literature review on answering these critical questions, then the typology of the type of literature review that you're doing is one where people will say, ah, oh, so it's not a thematical, it's not a, it's not a thematical, uh, what's this, uh, it's not a, a, a theme-based review type, this is more a, a one that's based on critical questions. So you have uh, a typology that it relates to the critical, the critical review. And that means you've based the review elements on attending to critical questions that you want the literature to speak to. Of course, in all of this, your literature review does one or more of the following things. It should address or show us the gaps that exist in literature relating to your topic of interest. It must also allow us to see the different arguments so we are able to say, hey, um, this is an alternative theoretical or methodological approach that should be considered. It allows you to see the problem and how the literature offers po potential uh, ways of resolving that problem, albeit that there will be gaps in this literature. Then, of course, by you uh, looking at, systematically looking at all the information, critiquing it and so forth, you actually strengthen some of the existing knowledge that we have in relation to particular questions. So those are the and if you remember those key key elements of what a literature review can do, you then understanding how to shape it. It's all just a matter of you going to find an old thesis that's respectable and saying, OK, these are the subheadings. 
I see the subheadings, but what how I will present my stuff will be the subheadings plus my own understanding of what needs to be there so that at the end my literature review fulfills the activities and requirements that one expects from a literature review. Now after chapter two which is a literature review you have this chapter that they call chapter three is the chapter that refers and speaks to theoretical and conceptual frameworks of the study. Now, before I can tell you a little bit about these things, I need to just revisit what a theoretical framework is and what a conceptual framework is. In a study or in research, when we refer to a theoretical, theoretical framework, what we are saying is, uh, what are the, the theories or bunch of theories that we think help us to better understand particular topics. So say, for example, if I was doing a study on um, students failing from their doctorates, and I was interested to know whether people failed because of biological hereditary issues or they fail because of social factors. I then am, I have three concepts that I play. One is this concept around success, whether or not people fail, what matters. The second concept is a concept to do with social theory. The third core concept is to do with uh, genetic hereditary theory. So I now have these three areas that my study is interested in. And if one theory helps me to understand the issue on success and failure, Another theory helps me to understand the issue on, on um, the social contributions. Um, or oh, another one helps us to look at uh, the biological contributions to success. Those three different theories that help me to understand the concepts that I'm looking at, they represent a theoretical framework. It's a group of theories that help to un explain and unpick the phenomena that I'm looking at. Now, remember those theories were written independently and uh, say the theory on success, it wasn't written with an expectation that it would be matched in a study where someone is looking at social factors and also looking at, at uh, hereditary factors. It wasn't written up like that. So essentially those theories were written with a slightly different purpose from your study. And for you to make the most out of them, you need to consider all of the relevant theories and only pick up the concepts in those theories that you think matter. When you pick up those concepts that matter from those different theories and you join those concepts together, that is what we call a conceptual framework. So it is a theoretical framework that you have developed yourself by just joining up different theories and playing with them. Now, this conceptual framework is literally you saying, look, these are the concepts that I believe matter to my study. And of course, once you've declared that those concepts matter, you are now in a roundabout way saying that these are the concepts that I will collect my data on. And for that reason, when I have a data collection instrument, these are the concepts that will be covered in it. Right, okay, so I've clarified what a theoretical framework is and how it relates to a conceptual framework. This chapter literally is about presenting the theoretical and conceptual frameworks in the chapter and in that order. So you start the chapter by saying, hey, welcome to chapter three. Chapter three is where I present the theoretical and conceptual frameworks of the study. Uh, the study was focusing on this, the three theoretical, two to five theoretical theories that are relevant in explaining the concepts I'm looking at are these. You give us an overview of those theories very briefly. 
then in giving us an overview you state which elements of those theories matter in your current study you join those elements together usually in a diagrammatic or in a figure of sorts that says these are the 20 things that matter and they and then you explain that those represent your conceptual framework then you give us an in an overview of how you will use this conceptual framework and the basic way that people use conceptual frameworks is you now use it to guide your data collection because it is the framework that conceptual framework that is the items that you will now include in your data collection instrument and so forth and so forth and so forth and once you've done that that is literally what chapter three looks like for a doctorate chapter three can be about 25 30 pages doesn't have to be much more than that these are just baseline numbers i'm giving you broad based numbers there is no limit to it but i'm saying typically it's about 25 or so pages chapter two on the other hand can typically typically be about 70 80 pages chapter one can typically be about 40 pages all these numbers I'm giving you are around about guesstimates, not fixed, but just guesstimates, because occasionally people will ask me to clarify these things. Now, this slide here, you have access to it. You can have a quick look at it, but I won't explain it because it says the exact same things that I've already um, made reference to in my piece of work so far in this presentation. Wait, there we go. Similar position in relation to this slide here. It tells us how you differentiate between conceptual and theoretical frameworks. Now, as a summary overview, I'm just saying theories are formulated to explain, predict, and understand phenomena. And in many cases, they help you to challenge and ex extend existing knowledge within the limits of the critical bounding assumptions. So basically what this is saying is what I've said already, that you would have identified theories that help you to explain the concepts that you're interested in. When you join those things, um, together they help you to better understand the, the total phenomena that you're looking at. Right, so we've got chapter three. Now, for folks, chapter four, very straightforward chapter, is the methodology chapter. Here, once again, you always begin a chapter by giving an overview of what the chapter is about. Um, and you also state that it's a methodology chapter. And in the methodology chapter, you give an overview of the research design that was chosen for your study. You give an overview of the research um, uh, methodologies that were used, the data collection approaches that were used, um, the, 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 you give an overview of how you selected the individuals that were, became uh, participants, you give an overview of the, the specific instruments that were used in your study, you give an overview of how you analyzed data so insights into the analysis methods you give an overview of how you managed particular challenging things about research how you dealt with issues such as uh, reliability how you dealt with issues such as validity how you dealt with issues such as trustworthiness all of that belongs in the methodology section folks if you have a good uh, proposal your proposal already specifies the methodology section but it gives it in a shorter format you now need to extend that the secret with the methodology section is that in as much as you're telling us what you're doing you are defending why you did what you did you are also giving showcasing to us that you know the alternatives to what you chose and you can 
do a head-to-head -head comparison between the methodology you chose and the ones you didn't choose so you can explain to us why your chosen approach offered advantages in ways that the ones you didn't choose failed to do. So that is this, the chapter. Once again, it is this chapter is easier to understand if you look at the methodology chapters of other people and you take the subheadings and you think, right, where, where do I disagree with this? What can I build on this? What can I do to include, to improve? And um, what all those methodology bits are literally to do with you giving as much insight to the reader about the steps that you followed to collect data, to analyze data, to assess how, you know, things that made your study more valid, more reliable. Right, so now folks, I have also given details here of some of the things that you include in your data um, in your data uh, collection process. And the basic, and, and I say this because I don't want to overly complicate this, but I also want to show you that so the way that the methodology sections of, of work are created follows principles that you describe to us the processes that you followed, you do so logically, uh, and when you do that, you start from the most, uh, the, the more umbrella concepts. So you tell us what the big design paradigm you chose. Was it qualitative? Was it quantitative? If it was qualitative, what type of qualitative was it? Was it ethnography? Was it phenomenology? If it was phenomenology, what type of phenomenology was it? And then you go down that way until you literally do that for the data collection approaches that you chose for the data analysis options that you utilized um, for uh, issues to do with how you dealt with your presence as a data collector, all those things. You, you include them, you give us a sense of what you did, you evaluate what you did in the methodology, and you can evaluate that by comparing to the options that were not chosen, by doing anything or explaining in a way that allows to get an insight into the efficacy of the choices that you made. Essentially, you will give us specific procedures and the techniques that you utilize throughout your study to identify, select, process, and analyze information about a topic. All the things about how you chose the people you chose, um, uh, all the things about how you made sure that the study that you were doing was as close to exploring the truth of your phenomena as is possible. How did you manage such requirements as validity and reliability? Um, you tell us in essence how you collected the data or how you genera generated it and how you analyzed it. So, so far folks, we that was chapter four. Remember chapter one was the introduction, chapter two, the literature review, chapter three was the, was the theoretical and conceptual framework, chapter four was the methodology, and chapter five is where you present the findings, the results, you present the data, you present your analysis outputs, and in essence, you present your, present your findings. This chapter, like every other chapter, you start with an introduction of what the chapter is. You give us a roadmap of what that chapter will include. Then, of course, you now have the ability, when you present a roadmap, you can tell the reader that, hey, when I present my findings, I'm going to do it in this way. I will start by giving an overview of the characteristics of the participants that I have. So the first part of your chapter five, your results chapter will be you giving things like the age, the sex, gender, of course, 
just sex or gender, whichever one you want to utilize, level of education or participants, whatever the the characteristics that you were interested in collected data on were. And you would you would have the first section present those things, share with us what the numbers were, how what they mean, and so forth. Then the next section is after you've told us the characteristics of the populations, then you can now say, hey, my study was interested in answering five questions. Those five questions are essentially your research questions from your proposal from chapter one, or they are objectives that you have turned from statements into questions. And you say, I was interested in these five questions and specific questions were asked from the participants to address each of these issues. Then you present your findings in in a sequence where maybe the first set of your findings speaks to question one. So if the quest, first question was, what are the weaknesses of students who, who do not do well at universities? Then all your findings that relate to weaknesses, you put them in that section. Then the next chapter, the next section might be to do with um, what were the strengths of those who do well? Then all your findings that relate to that question you do together. Now someone will say, hey, but Prof, if I ask the same question to people that I do individual interviews with, I ask the same questions to people who answered me with questionnaires, I ask the same question to people who answered, who did focus groups, how do I represent that in a results chapter? Now, folks, there is no single correct answer. But what I say is use a coherent logic. So one possible coherent logic might be that you would say, look, whether the answer was being provided by someone through a questionnaire or through a, an individual interview or through a focus group, I will still refer to it. I will still refer to that to that answer in the section that relates to the question. All I will do is that maybe the first part of the section will include results from the interviews. The second part of that same section will, will have results from the focus group. The third section of that same part will have results from a questionnaire. Then all the results that relate to one question, regardless of what the data source is who can be presented together in, in one section of your chapter. Then your next chapter, next section will do the second question and give feedback from all the different data types and data sources. So essentially what then happens is instead of splitting up, some people will have a chapter, a results chapter where they present all the results from the from the interviews first, all the results from the questionnaire second, all the results from the other data collection approach later. You can do it that way or can you, you can do it the way I proposed, but whichever way you choose to do it, you need to have given a logic. At the beginning of your, your chapter, you need to have given a roadmap or how you are presenting these findings because it is that roadmap that buys you license to do what you want to do. Now, the next thing that's always a challenge is people will say, hey, in my results section, how do I represent my analysis? Folks, with analysis, you tell us how you intend to analyze in the methodology section. But within your results, you don't actually do the physical analysis. All you do is to give us the outputs of the analysis. So in your results section, I will just see the conclusions that you drew as a result of analysis, but you won't walk me through all the little bits and steps of how you analyzed because that would be unmanageable. It's difficult to do. So if anything in the result section, we will see the output of your analysis rather than uh, be be exposed to the steps that you went through to do the analysis. So the, 
various statistical tests won't be presented at such, but the results of those state states tests will be presented. Now there is issues around interpretation. So when we talk about interpretation, many people will say this is what I found. And, uh, and then they will say what I found means this, but you are then meant to actually draw some analysis about what the thing you found means in relation to existing research. And the, that's the part that is called the interpretation. And many people will query or debate or be unclear about where the interpretation happens. The answer is there is no true place where it happens, but generally people do it at the latter part of their results um, activity. So they will make sure that they do the interpretation at the very, very end um, of the results section of their work. So they will basically do the literature, they will basically do the, the, the the interpretation at the at the point where they would um, they've presented their findings, they've presented their discussions, they've presented a whole range of things to tell us what they found. Then they have a section where they they now say, okay, these things I found. This is how they relate to other research that's already existing in relation to the topic that they are looking at. So that's where the data analysis or, or sorry, the interpretation of data will occur. And so in that, in the interpretation, you are literally just saying, look, these findings that I've got, what do they mean in relation to what other people have done already in my field? And of course, with interpretation, it's you being creative, it's you putting things together and making a sense of these things. Now, there is other things that are related to, to the data interpretation presentation story. And I think those are things that we will deal with when we speak to uh, sections where we say, how do you write up results? So we will have plus sessions where we talk to you about how you write up your results. And that is something that can't be handled in the context of this presentation. Now, so um, all this stuff to do with uh, data presentation is all really to do with how you write and show us the results that you've got. When you have done all this, you've got the results, you've told us what you saw, you've told us how what you saw relates and compares to existing research. The next thing that you're meant to do is go to chapter six. Chapter six carries a very, very specific role within um, the study because it is that chapter where you, you are, it's the chapter that distinctly exists in, a, res, in a, a doctoral study and you would not find anywhere else. It is that chapter that distinctly separates your study from any other. It distinctly separates your study from any other level of study. So a theory development chapter, which is chapter six, is where you specifically make your work stand out because it is a PhD and you develop theory. But in that chapter, the theory development chapter, is designed in a very specific way. Hey? You design it in a very specific way. Uh, and, and that specific way that you design it in is, um, sorry folks, wait, yep, yeah. Let's not lose this, okay. The theory development section, you specifically focus on walking the reader through how you turned your results into a theoretical contribution that will now be the output of your study. So some of you might develop a framework, some of you might develop a model, some of you might develop strategies, some of you might have recommendations. 
All of those things belong in this chapter. But before, before you do, um, you get into, into the actual sharing of your theory, whether your theory is a framework, whether your theory is a, is, um, whether your theory is a framework, whether your theory is a, is a, is, is a model, whether it is strategies, you there is the process by which you take us to that theory is the same. So once again, you start your chapter by saying, hey, this chapter that we call theory development involves uh, the joining together of all my findings and putting them together in a way that I can make some theoretical sense of what is going on. But before I can do that, you, you must share some some theory, some information and understanding of what the building blocks of theory are. So that section, the first part of that chapter, you tell us a little bit about how theory is developed, the stages that are involved in theory development. You tell us about the attributes of theory, that theory is developed in this way. You talk about the strengths and weaknesses of relying on theory. Uh, you tell us about the limitations of, of um, relying on theory. Then somewhere in all of this, you find an opening to say, hey, even though these are the processes that you follow, I was able to put back my, put together my findings and come, come up with an outcome that I present in this. And then you present your framework, whatever that framework is, or whether you present it as a model, you present it as a framework, you present recommendations. Once you have done that in this chapter, the next part then becomes you looking at the strengths and weaknesses of that thing that you have presented. You say, These are, this is the theory I'm proposing. Here's where I think it's strong. Here's the, the part that I think is very valuable about it. Here are the limitations that I think this proposed theoretical contribution has. Uh, here, here are my recommendations about what can be done in the future to make it a better theory. What are the alternative ways that one could have thought about this? So that whole chapter tells us, gives us an opportunity to understand how you build theory, gives us an opportunity to see your theoretical output it gives us an opportunity to critique, to hear you critiquing your theoretical output. It gives us an opportunity to see you tell us what the strengths of your theoretical contribution are. It also allows us to hear from you about likely alternatives that you think exist to what you proposed. And it also gives us a chance to, to hear what you recommend as a way of strengthening the theoretical output that you've got. So that's chapter six. And typically, folks, that chapter can be anything from depending on how people handle it and depending on what it is that they themselves are proposing. That chapter can be uh, in the region of 30 pages or so. It doesn't, it's not a hard and fixed rule as it isn't with all the chapters, but it is, this is a roundabout average that's required. And remember folks, whatever it is you present, even if all you are presenting as a product of your study are recommendations, you still have to engage in critiquing the strength of those recommendations. There are limitations in as far as them being applied in practice. What your recommendations mean for the future, of the field that you're in. So regardless of whether it is a rigid model you present, strategies you're coming up with, a framework you have or recommendations, all of them can be treated as theory that you have developed. And you must assess it, critique it, acknowledge its potential weaknesses, its strengths and so forth. Then finally, 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 after you've done all this, you get to have that summative chapter, chapter seven, which is really your discussion and your conclusions. In this chapter, you're able to offer 
um, to discuss the entirety of your work. So you are able to really discuss everything that was covered by your study from you uh, maybe presenting the initial part of your discussion chapter as an overview of what your study looked at, an overview of um, the questions that your study was interested in, an overview of the key um, areas of unknown knowledge that your study exposed, and literally you walk us through um, the same the overview of your entire study but this time you're walking us through in the opposite way from the way an introduction does remember an introduction was walking us through what is about to happen but your discussion and conclusions actually walk us through what has already happened in relation to your study so you walk us through those things but at the very, very end, towards the latter part of your discussion part, you have the opportunity to now offer a much more global critique of your study and talk about what your study really brings that was not around. So you talk about the unique contributions of your study. Then you're able to also critically talk about the overall limitations of your study and all those things that are very specific to you showing that you are now closing up the work that you have done in relation to this topic that you're looking at and you are literally you are posing to the world you're coming out to the world and saying these are the big things that i have done but here are the limits of what i've done and those folks are what your 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 discussion looks at. You discuss the implications. How do your results that you've got match with other things that have been done previously? Do they support what others have shown? Do they challenge existing theory? How do your results matter? Are there any implications to your area of practice from what you found? What are the limitations of your work? what did your results fail to cover are there any limitations in terms of how your findings can be used by others in the future are there things that you discovered once you started the study as things that were important for you to look at those are what you things you discuss then finally very finally the conclusion is the last part of your of your thesis of your main text and you just wrap up the this, this the thesis you summarize the main findings you make sure you don't present any new information no new arguments uh, you you go back if you had a specific research question you do what you can to offer a summative opinion about how you answer that make sure that you're clear and you're concise um, also make some commentary about confirming how well you think you've answered this question that you went to to you are trying to understand then make some very minor uh, mentions of some of the recommendations but close by emphasizing the unique contribution your study has done make sure that you end at that point because it is that which makes your work a doctorate and nothing else that the unique contribution that you can claim that is the main body after that the reference list of course i think i don't need to specify that too much each of you has, have specific guidance from your departments and so forth and then there is the things that i said are what you have at the end uh, the appendices and these can uh, include or must include at least uh, your ethics certificate uh, the co an example of a consent letter, uh, maybe some insights into gatekeepers' letters so people can see uh, what le letters were written to your gatekeepers to seek permission. Uh, you will have some examples of the instruments that you use to collect data. Uh, UNISA doesn't require you to put in your proof of registration. Some other people, places ask for it. We do require that you have an editor's certificate to show that your work has been professionally edited. 
And then we don't require a plagiarism report at the point of submission, but remember you keep a copy of it because at some point, once we are happy with uh, when when you are about when you are submitting this, you give your 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 supervisor the plagiarism report so they can be confident in supporting you to submit your work. Right. Folks, that is uh, the end of this. I am now going to try and take us to the questions and see how we are uh, set up in relation to uh, to the questions that have been posed to me. Here we go. I will now stop presenting and focus in on the questions. I know this has taken a little bit longer than the usual thing, but uh, unfortunately the detail of the doctoral thesis is much more uh, elaborate. Now folks, let us look at questions. We have a great many questions. Um, firstly, we had uh, said we had started later. I apologize for that. We had initial connectivity problems. Um, I will struggle to understand and conceptual framework and I'm supposed to write it chapter three. Uh, this was written at 556 before I taught and spoke about uh, the conceptual framework, Daphne. I think I've attended to it. We do have a session on conceptual and theoretical frameworks on our, on our range of sessions that are available to you. I implore everybody to go and listen to that because you really, really need to get a much more global opinion. Um, uh, OK, so there's someone who's asking about mixed methods research. Basically, Belda is asking about whether you do separate chapters for each. Belda, there are different schools of thought. Some schools say you must separate the chapters out. But once you separate the chapters out, you create a unique problem hey? and you and that problem that you create is you suggest that the questions and the topics. That you're focusing on are indeed things that can be looked at separately. So many people actually prefer the route where you you have uh, you, you, you have one chapter for all the methodologies and uh, you may and you 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 remember you're meant to write a roadmap at the beginning of your chapter. You specify that you've chosen the option of simultaneously presenting things from the mixed methods approach in one chapter. There are many authors, many researchers that have supported this approach. You cite those re researchers as your support and then you go ahead with the singular chapter. In that singular chapter, I've already spoken to the fact that you can make decisions. You can make a decision by whether you 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 give your results according to the methodology you used or you give your results according to the question that was being answered. So if your question that was being answered involved you uh, citing feedback from the questionnaires and feedback from the interviews, then you can do that one after each other but make it clear that you've grouped it together because it speaks to the same issue rather than having things set up differently to according to whether it's quantitative results first, qualitative results second. You may do the quantitative results alone, the qualitative results alone, but at the very end, your discussion about what those results mean has to include, has to bring them together. So, so that's part of that. Remember, it also matters whether you did a sequential study or a, 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 um, a concurrent study. If a concurrent study meant you did two things at the same time, then it makes sense for it to all be in one chapter. If you did a sequential study, then there's a potential for arguing that you should use two chapters. But once you do two chapters, you can't then have a separate third discussion chapter of each. 
But ultimately, I tell you, I have seen the different versions and at a doctorate level, you are better off having one very long chapter. That is a section on quantity results, quality results, then a discussion at the end that deals with all of them. As long as at the beginning of the chapter, you explain your, your reasoning, you say that the choice you've made has been supported by others, Creswell, many others write about this, just cite from that. Um, my supervisor asked me to start with chapter two as theoretical framework. Will this make a difference? Folks, this is the first time in my life that I've heard that theoretical framework is chapter two. Um, what I do know is that in the literature review, some people may include relevant theories because, but you certainly, remember we are talking, I'm talking to doctoral students here. In a dissertation of limited scope for a master's level, then you can have theoretical concepts in chapter two. But in a doctorate, you need to have a standalone theoretical framework chapter, and that happens as chapter three. So Hasina, I think there's a slight challenge there. I hope that I'm talking to you and you're a doctoral student, uh, and therefore my answer applies. Uh, where shall I start writing when I registered, registered for research components? I'm writing the literature review and methodology to apply for ethical clearance as well as my advisors. Am I on the right track? Right, okay. So if you have not received ethical clearance, you can't be developing chapters. You need to develop the proposal to get ethical clearance. So I think anonymous, there's a, a slight misunderstanding there. You cannot, in essence, you are trying to now write chapters for a proposal that is yet to be approved. What if it's not approved? What if you're not given ethical clearance? The chapters become meaningless. The literature review and the methodology parts that you write are little components to inform your proposal. They are not chapters yet. So that, um, is it acceptable for the methodology section to be incorporated into chapter one? Chapter one is an overview of what is coming. So it will have elements of methodologies, but it is not, it is, it is just a taster. It's literally an abstract extended. That's what chapter one is. So, so, so you will incorporate methodology things, but I think I explained that when I spoke about the purpose of chapter one, that it gives introduction, background, and overview of the, the thesis. If my topic does not have enough material from UNISA library, can I use other relevant papers? Uh, moderator, folks, in a, a doctorate is a, is, a, is a global study, so you use literature from all over the world, simple. Uh, if you limit yourself to UNISA, it's not a doctorate. Prof, can a unique contribution also be a way that a specific existing theory can be relooked or reconceptualized? If you are reconceptualizing and extending current theory, it is a type of unique contribution, but you have to defend why it's necessary for you to extend something that exists. So that way you do that if you can prove the pre-existing pre thing has got substantial weaknesses that make it unusable. Prof, are participants of this section only those in the first stage of the research proposal? Um, this session here is for people who are writing chapters after they've had their research proposal. People who have actually got ethical clearance and are developing chapters. That's who the primary target group or the examples that I'm giving are. If you want things to do with developing proposal, you need to go back to our earlier sessions that are available on the video. I'm a first year PhD student and received comments just two times. Am I behind normally given timeline? Yes, you are. Um, look, I don't know what time of the year you registered, but by now people are submitting their, their proposals. And that is the reason why we are doing chapter development now. We are helping those people who are past proposals. 
who are writing up their individual chapters for the actual thesis. Thanks for a detailed explanation and a beautiful voice. Thank you very much. Would it be a better idea to illustrate the content with diagrams, images, for instance, in theoretical framework, methodology, discussion? Thanks. Saima, yes, diagrams are especially useful. Once again, I advise you to go and find two or three thesis examples that have been passed and look at them for all these pieces of guidance. But I tell you when it comes to you illustrating, for example, a theoretical framework or a conceptual framework, you is best done by diagram. To tell us the summary of method, your methodology, a diagram will help. But all these things are better understood if you have seen the thing that you are trying to, to look at, to, to emulate. What are the measurements to report on in research methodology chapter concerning the conceptual framework used in the study? How do we measure the conceptual framework's relevance? Um, no, 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 look, uh, there is a question here about measuring conceptual frameworks and so forth. It has nothing to do with chapter development. I think there's a mixture of concepts here and so forth. Hey, uh, It's this question I can answer, but I think it's, it's a little bit convoluted and it's, it's outside the scope of this session and I won't engage in it, unfortunately. Data analysis, is it important to use the structural equation model if the study employs a conceptual framework? Once again, that question is not for this session. It's not for this session, folks. Um, yeah, it's not for this session, it's for another session. Data analysis, do we have regression analysis and factor analysis if one choose to use the structural? Folks, this, there are three questions that have come from an anonymous person about structural equation uh, modeling. It is not, this session is not about that. This session is about the format of your chapters rather than the choices you make in relation to data analysis. So I think we need to separate that out without confusing people. Um, uh, Mike has a question about chapter two. It discusses all theories related to the topic. Does it therefore mean chapters three utilizes the same theories? Okay. Mike, in chapter two, you discuss research. You discuss research related to the topic. In chapter three, the theoretical framework, you discuss the theories. So one is based on empirical data that you review. Then the other is related on theoretical data. So, but if you were at master's level, they join the two as if they are the same. But at doctoral level, Literature review is about you looking at previous studies and critiquing them. Then chapter three is about utilizing carefully handpicked theories that you think are good for your, for illustrating your topic and uh, presenting them to us. Not critiquing, critiquing them, just presenting them. The, the literature review is about critique. The chapter three is about description and presentation of. I hope that helps. Is it possible to come up with a new theory or model if there was no detailed measurements or variables? Rather, okay, here's another structural equation modeling issue which is not relevant to this, but the answer to that question about can you come up with a, a theory um, when you have no detailed variables, you, you, ca you can't come up with a theory that is a reliable and, and significant and robust if you didn't have detail of used variables. But that question does not belong here. Uh, what tools do we need to come up with a new theory? That you have to find depending on the theory. So you have to go and read up on the theory development process and it will tell you that to develop a theory you need this. But in essence, to develop a theory, you need literature that relates to your concept. You need data from empirical information that you found and so forth. Um, uh, Lula, thank you very much for, for uh, uh, 
acknowledging the presentation. I'm really, really grateful. Uh, Pindi, will I be wrong to highlight my conceptual framework when I'm giving the research scope in chapter four? Yes, you can. You can highlight your conceptual framework in chapter four. Remember, once you have done a conceptual framework, you are telling the reader that these are the concepts that matter. So it makes sense for you to say the scope of your study is driven by those concepts. Prof, my proposal uh, title is No Marshals That Related uh, Literature View in no materials that are related. Uh, oh, yeah, I can't I can't make sense of something that was written at 745. There's something about uh, I think the person is saying that their proposal has no materials in the UNISA library. Folks at a doctoral level, UNISA library is just one of the options you have. You must use the entire world library as long as the, level of materials is in line with what we call scholarly work. Um, hi, is it acceptable to discuss a theory not explored in chapter two at theory development stage? Absolutely, you can do. Uh, remember, I think Mike, um, you asked an earlier question. Chapter two is not about discussing theories. Chapter two is about discussing research. Chapter three is about discussing hand-picked limited theories. But later on, when you're doing your discussion, you include other theories. You're welcome to. Will the supervisors guide us on the recommended UNISA editors? Um, they look, uh, those are all individual arrangements around um, editors. You will get, you will get um, supervisors who know editors, but generally, you are meant to seek out your own editors. Wow, Miss um, Reginald, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Very clear and concise, absolutely illuminating. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Reginald. Uh, then I have some uh, a question, someone acknowledging and thanking uh, the presentation. Um, it was clear and not far different from the master's dissertation, except for chapter three. Um, yes, OK, so here we go, folks. Uh, some people will do it at a master's without a chapter three and pass. A full master's without a chapter three and pass, but trust me. You have only passed because the examiner that you worked with did not align to what they call this the Cochrane, Cochrane structure of, uh, of full research dissertations or theses. So if someone who's marking you does not know it, and many don't know it, they will pass it. But I train you for you to be ready so that if you are assessed by an Oxford University professor, they still pass you. So there will be limits there will be difference, differences. Um, thank you, Charlene. Thank you very much. She's acknowledged the, the feedback. Folks, thank you. I think I'm answered out. I notice it's 8 p.m., those of you. Um, uh, Doreen is asked for something on literature reviews. Folks, I will, I will, I will do that at some point and we will we will look at it it is some way i have a feeling we've done it already but i uh, so doreen please go and have a look at our presentations that we have it might already be there uh folks it's 8 p.m i have been teaching for a lot of the hours of the day i think uh, i can safely say good night we are seeing each other on uh, on next week on the 6th and then we will have open mic where people can ask any questions. So the person who was asking questions about structural equation modeling, maybe that's an opportunity for you to, to present those things. But once again, you know, the thing with some of these uh, questions is I need to have seen the context of what choices other choices have been made because you can someone says is it better to go right or left 
I need to know what context they are talking about for me to be able to say categorically that they can go right or they can go left. But uh, in any case, next week, the sixth, same time, same place, is the time for us to have this session. I thank you very, very much. I hope that um, you have a great evening. And um, yes, take care. Uh, good night. Bye.